morning. Welcome all to hearing number 10 of this period of sessions called the situation of political rights and gender intersectionality, diversity and gender in Brazil. This is a hearing that was requested by a group of organizations from the civil society who are here in this hearing. We appreciate your trust in the commission and we would also like to thank the delegation from the state for attending this hearing. My name is Joel Hernandez. I am the Commission's Rapporteur for Brazil, and I will be presiding this hearing as such. I would like to apologize on behalf of the President of the Commission, Commissioner Urrejola, who is unable to attend this hearing because she is currently at a hearing with the Inter-American Court. I am joined in this hearing and I would like to greet them. First of all, Margaret May McCauley. She is among others, she is the Rapporteur for Afro-Descendants and Against Discrimination and she is also the Rapporteur for the Rights of Women. Also, Commissioner Esmeralda Rosemena is here who among her responsibilities has the rapporteurship for children and adolescents. We also have, and I would like to greet her, Ms. Maria Claudia Pulido, the acting executive secretary of our commission. So the you already are aware of the methodology, but I will repeat it. First of all, we will listen to the civil society that for 20 minutes, please, when you um, present yourself, say your name, and when you introduce yourself, say your name. Then we will listen to the state for 20 minutes and then the Inter-American Commission for 20 minutes, for 12 minutes. The remaining time will be used by the civil society and then the state. In order to uh, follow the time, you have a little timer here, please pay attention to it so we don't run out of time. I will give you a little reminder before it's time, but it's important to stick to this time limit. At this hearing, we have simultaneous interpreting into Spanish, into English and Portuguese, so you can activate it on the little globe you will see on the bottom of the screen and we also have subtitles for those following us and if you need to read the subtitles of the presentations. Uh, we will now give the floor for 20 minutes to the civil organizations. Thank you very much. The, may the civil society take the floor? I will speak. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, honorable members of the commission. On behalf of all petitioners, I would like to thank you for granting this important thematic hearing. Good morning, everyone. I am Aniel Franco, founder and executive director of Mariel Franco Institute, an organization founded to fight for justice, water the seeds, defend the memory, and spread Mariel's legacy around Brazil and the world. I am her sister. I am really proud of her. She was a Black counselor, bisect, bisexual, who lived in a favela and was murdered in March 18, 2018. Political violence is a tool used to deprive black, black women and trans of exercising their political rights. It is a method with the specific purpose of preventing the issues they advocate for, such as the debate about gender equality, race, sexuality, from occurring in institutional policy spaces. Such violence haunts them before, during, and after the electorate period, and it is a grave violation to human rights, which will only end in the moment the state recognizes this state, this phenomenon as 
determining factor for the recent setbacks that Brazilian democracy has faced. According to a survey conducted by the Mariel Franco Institute during 2020 elections in Brazil, 98.5%, almost 100% of black women candidates reported having suffered at least one type of political violence. The main violence pointed out in the research was online representing mostly um, the online attacks were suffered. The attacks in these uh, occurred mainly, ma mainly in the online environment. These attacks involved racist, sexist, transphobic, racist, and Curses, which include also episodes of religious racism aimed at Black women candidates practicing religions of African origin and religious hatred aimed at transsexual and transvestite women. The survey shows that only 32% of the candidates reported the episode suffered and that among the reasons for not filing the complaint is the fact that they feel unsafe or afraid to report the violence. Among those who filed the complaint, 70% stated that it did not provide them with safety, and they added that no training or support from political parties or justice was granted to understand which protective measures should have been taken. The group, the threat to minority groups such as Black women, transsexual, and transvestites was, was worsened since 2018 election. Note that most of the candidates and Black, transgender, and transvestite women parliamentarians identified themselves as human rights advocates with trajectories of struggle and social transformation. It is essential to think about which are the solutions and changes needed to warranty the protection of these women's lives. I emphasize that our intention from now on is to to report the situations that they experience and to think of strategies to act together on the phenomenon of gender and race political violence in Brazil and the impact it has on the exercise of rights of politicians. There is an urgent call to take to other levels the need to promote mechanisms to tackle all types of women of violence against Black women, transsexual women, and transvestites, and deviate from the policies that today exist in Brazil, which are inadequate to warranty the protection and political rights. Thank you, and I would like to give the floor to Ana Lucia. Your microphone is muted, it's on mute. Good morning, I am Ana Lucia Martins, the daughter of a domestic worker and a maintenance worker and the last of five brothers. I am a Black woman, feminist, anti-racist and human rights advocate. I am a teacher, public servant, unionist. I work with the organization Ashanti Mulieres Negras from Joinville, affiliated to the articulation of Brazilian Black women. I am a member of the Forum of Women and the Association of Human Rights. I am a counselor since 2020, the seventh, seventh most voted with 3,000 votes. I am the first women, woman elected by the Workers' Party and the first Black woman elected in the history of the city. This achievement made me a victim of death threats and racism, racism right after the votes were counted. These threats have sensitized people and institutions that defend human rights who mobilized in my defense and demanded a response from the state. Such violence is the same that exterminates women, men, children, and Black youth in a deliberate way as a project to exclude the largest portion of the population in the country, driven by racism. Since no November 2020, almost nothing has happened in the face of the death threats. On the contrary, I continue to be a victim of violence through social media messages inciting hatred and intolerance in addition to direct verbal violence in one of my work visits. The defense of the rights of public servants, workers, of groups historically excluded are reasons for direct or symbolic offenses and violence. 
experiencing Congress sessions or through social media, doubting my suitability, exposing my privacy through the spread of materials that are attempts to ridiculize, inhibit and silence me. These are creeping and dehumanizing practices by individuals who do not recognize Black women as subjects of law, disrespecting and hurting the democratic process that elected me, even in the face of these attacks, we still don't have a response from the state. Such violence affected my freedom, my right to circulate, my mental and emotional health, and they break me down and move me from the place of tranquility and security that non-Black men and women are used to, places that should be common to women committed to the struggle for human rights and social justice. The historic milestone of this achievement for the city for women for different generations that feel represented in the election of the first black woman in the city was threatened and harms the identity of 17% of the population of the largest city in the state of Santa Catarina. The violence, violence directed at me affects my children, grandsons, family members, advisors, and supporters. Many defense and protection attempts were made, as, such as police reports, testimonies, complaints, meetings, and hearings with public security agencies. It was only through the articulation of the institutions that act in the defense of human rights advocate that effective action was taken, taking the complaint to the international organizations. We know that the omission of the state has an origin, which is the same that ignores daily death on, of the country's black population, structural ra racism. The state does not take care of our lives and does not warranty our rights to democracy. The emotional and legal help came from my friends, supporters and families and by the Marielle Franco Institute from November to January, and they were essential, but since January, my security is paid for myself at, at reduced hours now. The question asked by Aniel Franco has not yet been answered. Who guarantees the security of elected Black women? This question remains with us in our daily struggles as we are on our own. I now give the floor to Carolina Yara. Good afternoon, everybody. I am Carolina Yara. I am an activist, intersex, transvestite, Black woman, and the city councillor in the collective mandate of the feminist wing of the Socially and Freedom Party in Sao Paulo. And I was elected with over 46,000 votes. In the collective mandate, the holder of the parliamentary seat undertakes to share his office and decision-making power with a group of people called co-parliamentaries. I am the first and the only intersex person in the Brazilian parliament and I always have had my rights violated in the country, either in childhood with their genital mutilation that I suffered to hide my genital ambiguity and now threatened by political terrorism. At dawn on January 26, I was approached by my mother in my room, desperate. She told me that she heard two shots in front of the gate. And in the morning, that was confirmed. Security cameras images were provided by neighbors and showed a car that stopped in front of the house right at the time of the shots. And from there on, my whole life was altered and I was pressed to escape from there, from a political attack. Investigations still take place to answer some of the questions in the case. Who was responsible for the threat? The shots fired were from firearm or an explosive? Were there masterminds, principles or not? While these questions are not answered, there is at least one remark that transphobia and racism made me leave my home and be in exile in the city where I am a city councillor. It seems that they punish us because we are boundless Black and trans women who dare to enter spaces of power. They want to drive us crazy, leave us paralyzed in the face of fear of death. And the Sao Paulo City Council 
of which a member did not nothing to protect the members of collective mand mandates. And it delegitimizes that way of doing politics and does not warranty my security even after an attack. Now I ask, which is the connection between these threats to, to transgender parliamentarians and the number of 175 trans and transvestite women murdered in Bra Brazil in 2020, which is a connection between Brazil, which uh, whose figures, human uh, rights, advocates death and the threats that we are threat suffering. Who is going to restore the tra trauma I endure now? Which state is this which incentives or encourages LGTB uh, phobia through countless statements by the president? I am no, I'm not a martyr and I don't want to be a martyr. The Brazilian state has a duty to warranty that I and all black trans leaders can stay alive to make politics and the responsibility for my safety cannot be exclusively uh, in the hands of the civil society or the party. We cannot naturalize the trivialization of death in Brazil, whether due to murders and threats, whether due to public, poor public health management. I give the floor to Erika Hilton. Good morning, everyone. I am Erika Hilton. I am a Black woman transvestite, the most voted women in the elections in Brazil in 2020. And we are in a limbo in our countries. There is a strong persecution to human rights advocates and to elected black women in our country. I suffered a series of threats within the institution without the city chamber in Sao Paulo, the greatest city in Latin America, they tried to enter my office and I have to process more, more than 50 people for racist and transphobic attacks in social media. In Brazil, there is an intolerance and a denial to accept that we are sentenced to dehumanization and we cannot return. And the Bra Brazil is a, the first country in the world which kills transvestites and uh, kills human rights advocates and now has a president which adheres to violence and encourages the persecution of black women and LGBTI community. It has been really complex to be a parliamentary in Brazil and to be able to exert our functions, knowing that we will have our, we, we are not going to have our physical security warranted. Several universities were closed and we are constantly attacked and persecuted and there is no policy. I ask again, who takes care of elected women? Which are the mechanisms that our country develops to face uh, political and gender violence against human rights advocates? The situation in Brazil is unsustainable. We are being excluded and we have to overcome hindrances so as to carry out the policy the politics that we would like to carry out they do not want to see the lgtbi community occupying spaces of powers and the mechanisms that make people feel intimidated are countless and they are and they depart from the Planalto Palace, from the president. The situation of women, of human rights advocates, it's really serious and it is really important to be able to file complaints for all those abuses and the reality that we face, whether we are par members of parliament or members of the civil society. Bra Brazil is a racist and unequal country and it is LGBTI phobic and this is represented in the 
elected women, we have Marielle Franco who was murdered because she represented a project of uh, blackness in the in those in the favelas and those people are treated badly treated in Brazil. So it is a very serious situation. They do not allow us to exercise our functions. There are attacks, death threats to our places of work, and there is a lack of answer by the public power to all those institutions. I give the floor to Bruna Benedetti. Good morning. I represent the National Association of Transvestites and Trans, and it's very important to point out that several initiatives are encouraging transphobia, trying to include biological criteria, denying the right to recognize self-recognition and gender identity of trans people in different projects in the federal and municipal levels. Right now, the Ministry of Family has not made any action whatsoever in terms of the violence against cis, trans and transvestite women candidates or elected in 2018 that were disseminated in the media. And this is shown by the negligence by the state in recognizing those political violences or trying to find ways to eradicate them, especially with those that are not part of the foundation of the government that are the most affected by this violence. There is no dialogue possibility or even there is a lack of representatives from the ministry. And in this regard, we would like to uh, present the following recommendations for this. First, we would like to focus on the Brazilian state so it can be developed in the legislative chambers and in dialogue with city councillors and bodies of the judiciary, mechanisms for the prompt handling and treatment of complaints of political violence against black women, cis and trans transvestites, ensuring the identification and accountability of perpetrators of violence and ensuring psychological support for the victims, their advisors and family members. Also, we would like to urge the Brazilian state to promote coordinated and integrated actions with specialized cybercrime investigation police stations to hold authors accountable and inhibit the use of online tools and platforms to perpetrate attacks of political violence, particularly when driven by political structures, which are massive and deliberately sponsored. Focus on the Brazilian state to guarantee the training of members of the judiciary, the public prosecutor's office, the public defender's office, and the civil and federal police to increase the awareness of political violence against Black, trans, and transvestite women. Also, in terms of racial and gender discrimination, hate speech, anti-racist legislation, victims' rights, reparations, among others to promote public hearings, debates, and intersectorial discussions between state-owned agencies and society on the impacts of political violence motivated by transphobia and issues related to the trans population, to urge the Brazilian state to proceed with the approval of specific legislation on political violence against women with actions that include preventing, restraining, and punishing this type of violence with a specific perspective on Black women, transvestites, and transsexuals to exert pressure on the Brazilian state to expand its structure and budget for the program for protection of human rights defenders under the Ministry of Women, Family and Human Rights and the inclusion of candidates and parliamentarians in that program in order to guarantee the protection of these defenders of human rights and the free exercise of their free political rights. And finally, to carry out official missions to the country, listening to social movements and local civil society in order to gain a deeper understanding of the current context of violations of the rights of Black women, transsexuals and transvestites who are candidates and elected human rights and the worsening of the conflict situations that they feel that makes them vulnerable, as well as presenting the perspectives of international standards that can contribute to the improvement of national protection policies. We are going to send the document to the commission. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. 
I'll give the floor to the state now. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, commissioners. I am Joao Lucas Cantal, director of the Department of Citizenship in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and I am representing the members of the Brazilian state. First, the Federal Deputy Rosangela Gomez. I am also representing the representative of the Ministry of Women, Family and Human Rights, National Secretariat of Policies, Mr. Brito, Director of the Secretariat of Women, Teresina Neves, General Coordinator of Cultural Efforts, Sarete Aragon, and advisors, Rodriguez and Geneves. Also by the Secretariat of Policies for Equality, Mr. Paulo Roberto, and also Ezequiel do Espirito Santo. From the Secretariat of Global Protection, the Director of Global Policies for Protection of Gays, Transsexual and Transvestites, Marina Riva, the Special Advisor Office, and I would like to mention the chief of that office. And finally, on behalf of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, I am representing three more people. Now I'm going to give the floor to Dr. Paula Roberta. Hello, commissioners. The ethnical composition of a Brazilian society has different ethnical origins, including indigenous, black people, African, Portuguese, European from migratory waves, and other peoples from Asia. In 1932, with the creation of electorate justice, we had our first electoral code in Brazil with the promotion of the right to vote for women. And then women were able to vote and to be voted. Currently, we have most our population black and Afro-descendant, which are more than 50% of the population in the country. In the same way, women are also a majority, 51.54%, and Black women represent 27.11% of our population. Violence against women is a world problem that we need to fight. According to a study of the UN, the UNDP published Last year, 90% of the world population has some sort of prejudice against women. Therefore, political violence against women is a global phenomenon and not only a problem in Brazil. Therefore, the UN Women Organization in Brazil, together with the European Union, has launched a campaign, No Violence, for the political rights of women, a national mobilization for the prevention of violence against women in electoral context, the Brazilian government does not trivialize or naturalize the historical violence that women suffer in Brazil. Last year, for example, the Brazilian state through its Supreme Court guaranteed financial resources and time on radio and TV for female candidates. In terms of the demographics distribution in Brazil, also, they gave more time to black candidates and they accounted for 30% of the electorate funds. Also, in terms of the representation of black women in different position in the executive power as council women and mayors. And now we have over 3,000 black council women that were elected in 2020. And even more significant was the increase of candidates presented in 2016. 673 women were presented as candidates for mayors. And in 2020, 887 were presented. An increase of 24%. And for council women, above 65,000 in Brazil, and 
above 83,000 in Vinci Vinci. So it was an increase of 22%. In this way, it is clear that the political violence against women is not an individual problem, and it has a strong impact on Brazilian democracy. And we want to go towards a fairer and more egalitarian society, therefore struggling against this terrible practice by creating awareness on the population, in terms of perpetrator, that's the duty for all of us. And we can confirm that the Brazilian state is duly committed to fight all types of discrimination against women, regardless of their color or sexual orientation. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. I would like to thank the authorities for proposing this and the Inter-American Commission for accepting us. This meeting is a significant opportunity to present the spaces that Brazil has given in terms of political violence against women. The fight against this has been directly and systematically taken by the Ministry of Women, Family and Human Rights in the past two years. Also through different institutions in Brazil, both private and public, from the federal government in 2019. We, the National Secretariat of Policies for Women, created the debate in the sphere of the Mercosur, opened the meeting of Mercosur carried out in Brasilia with a workshop about political violence against women that gathered Damaris Alves, the representative of UN Women and the Brazilian Parliament. There, we promoted strategic partnerships, and since then, we have strengthened an, uh, an unprecedented movement in the Brazilian society, in TV, in every media, the theme, the topic was implanted. And then uh, the representation of women published in our country a document including the governmental support, and it was the first resolution in 35 years of that council. And this shows that we are working in a topic with a quite new debate and also with not enough dissemination in the society. But we are working on this topic and we have started actions that show the commitment of the Brazilian state with this cause. Throughout this path, we carried out research, we created partnerships and we, and we read a lot from Bolivia and Mexico and Paraguay about the topic and I would like to tell you some of the actions that we carried out in Brazil. We launched the project More Women in Power that includes several initiatives with the aim of eliminating the barriers or obstacles that would keep away women from politics and in order to foster their participation we offer online workshops also we have uh, a line for reports, 180 is the number, to receive all the complaints on political violence. And this is a very important line because it goes to more than 5,500 municipalities. And together with UN Women, we launched several campaigns. For example, a campaign uh, for the creation of awareness with them. And in 2020, we carried out 30 public events with the idea of creating awareness for the society in terms of political violence. We carried out with, set, with 18 political parties a covenant to fight political violence. We engaged several organizations throughout Brazil like UN Women, the Union of Council Women and Council Men in Brazil, the Congress, the public ministry, and different political parties. And let me bring you some important data that show how Brazil has truly worked on this topic that gathers us here today. Since 2018, the electoral justice decided that trans women should be taken into account in the female quotas. Also, it decided that the social name could be used in electoral records. And this 
would allow the self-declaration for each person that would like to be considered for office. And therefore, we believe that it is very important that we are doing a lot by and from the state. And this is how Brazil shows that rights are for everyone. And we would like to strengthen that this was very important because we were able to achieve a record number of trans people candidates in Brazil, a very large number, above 2,000 trans people decided to participate. I'm sorry, 270 people were candidates. And then there was a resolution that said that at least 30% of the free electoral propaganda should belong to women. The Brazilian justice also launched a program. Gender violence and political violence exists, and it consisted of several videos about parliamentary violence coming also from the initiative, the private initiative. Moreover, all the specific cases mentioned by requesters were object of actions by the state working on its own media and directing these complaints to the different organizations responsible for the resolution. And especially in the case of Ana Lucia Martinez, we clarified that as soon as we knew through the press that there was violence, we decided to go to the electoral justice department, the federal police, and the different organizations involved where the fact took place. Therefore, the state acted very quickly and all the things that needed to be done were done and the case is being accompanied. The fact is that the Brazilian state worked a lot. We also have legislative advances. And for this, I will give the floor to Rosangela Gomez, federal deputy, and she is the author of Law 340-2015 about political violence against women, and also the first black woman to have a position in the director's table in the deputy table. Good afternoon. I would like first to thank you for inviting me to talk about this important topic, which is political violence, a situation that has been taking place in Brazil with specific group, especially against black women. And I am a very proud member and representative of black women in Congress. I was born in the Baixada Fluminense, one of the most poor areas in Rio de Janeiro and in the entire country. And I am the daughter of a black woman too. I started working as a salesperson in the streets of Rio de Janeiro. And with a lot of efforts, I was able to get here. So I am a proud black poor woman from Rio de Janeiro that from the very beginning decided to exercise resistance against the violence that comes to us in different ways. And one of the reasons that took me to the public sphere was the desire to contribute so that more people like myself could have a voice in politics, which is a true element of transformation for any society. There are in Brazil laws fostering the entry of women in politics like the law that says that there should be 30% of women in the lists for elections. And this has shown that they want to do more for our women. And I then presented the project, the bill 349 in 2015, that is about political discrimination in election. And it covers all the cases presented here. This project was passed by Congress and my intention in presenting this project was that Brazilian women should be able to participate in election and be able to carry out and exert those functions with no discrimination based on gender and race. But it's hard for us to carry out our office the same way as men. We are almost half of the Brazilian population, but they are the absolute majority in 
the National Congress. And I would like to close this presentation by saying you that the deputies chamber wants to protect its citizens from political violence and also moving towards the true equality of rights. May God bless you all. And I hope that this could be a positive hearing. And let me tell you that our bill happened before all the cases that are presented by the requesting organizations today. Now I will give the floor to Prefeta Sue. Good afternoon, everybody. I am Solen Rosim, and it's a pleasure to be here with you to discuss a very important topic. I think that this hearing reinforces the importance of our campaign to combat uh, political violence. During the electoral campaign in 2020, I suffered racist attacks. They occurred after the results. And facing such disrespect, I was elected uh, city councillor in the city here in Paulista, one of the main important cities in the country with 57% of the votes. I registered uh, a report uh, we, um, the police gave me the necessary support and they discovered who was one of the authors. The, these people with this kind of behavior need to be corrected and the public prosecution officer also opened the case and I received the solidarity of many people who condemned these type of acts in, 20, in 2020. The combat to these situations must be constant. The racist phrases I received and the death threats at the same time, they make me sad, but they also make me more courageous. And I generally say that uh, we cannot be allowed to, we cannot allow discrimination because of, of that. Uh, the messages of support I received came from Brazil and all around the world. And I most of these cases are not launched to the media, but I got the support of lots of people. And I got the call from the Minister of Women and she was at my disposal to help me and uh, she has done so until now here in Bauru with our working team. We have worked a lot so that nobody is without attention, health and infrastructure. We want to apply policies together with the Minister of Women to that people who request it, who needs it. We need to respect differences and that is one of my main principles. I am the first woman who, woman who is governing over Bodu and um, lots of people discriminate me because I am a black woman. But when I look at this generation, I think it's for this generation that I have to stand up and resist. We defend that those cases and we are a role model for the generation. We need to find more uh, stronger people. We need to end with inequality. And some of the people that speak here are women who have been elected by a uh, by a country that looks at us as great representatives. I would like to give, to leave the door open so that other uh, women, black women, women can feel comfortable so as to be part of the political environment. There is a long road ahead of us, but I have a hope that there will be more respect to our differences. Thank you very much. Okay, so the interventions by the state have finished. Okay, thank you. Thanks for sticking to the time as well. So I will give the floor to the commissioner, Margaret Macaulay, the rapporteur for women's and Afro-descendants rights. 
Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I greet both the state and civil society uh, this morning who have come to inform us and uh, as to the situation of racial discrimination, racism, and intolerance, especially in relation to Black women, trans women, and transsex women in Brazil. I have a number of questions for the state, and um, I hope you would grant me the patience and the attention to listen to the questions so that we can have some specific answers. The first is, how does the Brazilian government monitor the cases of political violence which occur in the country? And this is specifically the monitoring device and policies and practices. How does the Brazilian government do this? And also, does the state have a data, have data disaggregated by gender and by race in relation to what is happening to groups of, of peoples in Brazil defined by their race and ethnic ethnicity and gender? Um, I, I think it saves time if I if I do the list, uh, Mr. President, uh, if you don't mind, or or I can write, I can do it because there's several. I, I'll do the whole list, and in that way it will be better. And um, to the also to the state, are there coordination initiatives between all the different public agencies within the state, which ought to deal with the issue that we're discussing today. I, I don't want to list them. We all ought to know all the agencies and especially the state must know the relevant ones. Um, and the specific question is in relation to coordination between them. And the next one is, can you let all of us know what is the focus on gender and race given by the Defender Protection Program? The focus on gender and race. And then does the Defender Protection Program have a specific protocol to deal with specific cases of political violence against black and trans women or are these cases dealt with in a standardized manner? And the penultimate one is, what are the initiatives of the state to guarantee the rights of victims of political violence to receive reparation and to ensure the principles of non-repetition? And a longish last one, which ought to be, does the, the Brazilian states ratify the Inter-American Convention Against Racism, Racial Discrimination and re Related Intolerance by the Senate, but it has not been signed into law by the current government. So to the state, Will the Brazilian government fulfill the commitment of depositing the convention before the OAS and give the convention the status of constitutional amendment and thereby boost public protection policies for the, the crimes covered and violations covered by it? And who are the, uh, the crimes covered by it, which are committed against the receptors of racial violence, racism, intolerance, and discrimination. So I hope my questions are clear for the state. 
And I look forward to your answer. And if you cannot give us fulsome answers today, please send us your answers in writing so that we can share those answers with civil society. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner Macaulay. And Commissioner Esmeralda, do you want to take the floor? Yes. Okay, thank you, Mr. President. And my acknowledgement to the representatives of the civil society who have shared with us their testimonies, their arguments in terms of the protection of the right to live a life free of violence in all its forms, in particular, political violence that has such a special connotation to be uh, addressed and to be understood or acknowledged as a priority in terms of the protection of rights. To the representation of the state of Brazil, our gratitude as well for listening to the different presentations and interventions where they, so we acknowledge the work that you're doing in this regard. Along this line, I would like to pose two more questions because um, Commissioner Margaret has already made a comment that I agree and that I support in everything that she's actually posed and explained. The intervention made by Rosangela, I'm not, I hope I'm not mistaken, making any mistakes with the names, in her presentation uh, as part of a political organization, I can't remember if it was the Congress. Okay, she talked about the fact that before the complaints that were filed uh, by the civil society, there was There was the law on quotas, and there was a project that was specifically devoted to fighting, fighting violence. So my question would be, if this was before, if this was issued before, can you measure the effectiveness of such project? in the development of the investigations, of the processes, or in the determination of the people who are responsible for these acts of political violence. So uh, to what extent can you make sure that this is effective or to know whether this is in force currently or not? On the other hand, following this line, Complaints that we've received today and the information of facts that we received today and facts of violence, even violence against the people who are present here now, I mean, virtually present, but today in this hearing, in terms of the protection that they need by the state to be able to face these complaints and I want to make a point here, make a difference with uh, between the investigation in itself that, of course, has to follow its own path. But before that, I mean, before the development of the process in itself, that is to say, the legal processes, do you have a system for special protection, for differentiated protection to address these kind of acts of political violence, specifically against women, political women or women in politics, Afro-descendants, trans, black women that have this special trait. That's why I'm making the point on this. That's why I'm talking specifically about how to provide a response, a protection response for these cases in particular. I would just like to know whether there is a program to address these issues with protection measures that are necessary for this kind of differential treatment or to address specifically 
these cases, this group of women in particular, and of gender diversity groups as well. Thank you, President. Those are the questions I wanted to add. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, now we can listen to the exec acting Se executive secretary. Thank you, Mr. President. I would just like to say that the commission has been working on this issue <laughs> in the past few years and on the country report that uh, it approved on February, the convention has been focusing on the um, structural historic <laughs> violence in Brazil and in particular in two groups the situation of Afro descendants, but also the situation of women and gender based violence. So I would just like to highlight this new country report that the Commission issued after 20 years. And there are eight recommendations, specific recommendations on the issue of the rights of women and also all of the dispositions of the executive secretariat. You can count on all of that for whatever assistance you need in following up this and interpreting these recommendations. Thank you. Thank you, Maria Claudia. As a rapporteur for Brazil, I would like to make some comments. I will not ask questions. My colleagues made very pertinent questions and I would like the um, petitioners and the state to have the time to reply. But as the Rapporteur for Brazil, I would like to congratulate both parties, the <laughs> requesting parties for bringing to the attention of the Commission an issue that is unique because of its content, uh, in content because it has to do with intersectionality in exercising political rights on the basis of gender, diversity and race. And this places us at a unique position where it's very important to strengthen the protection of the state by the state of these women who may be attacked uh, in exercising their rights or in living their lives. But I would also like to thank the delegation of the state for its presentations and for the diversity in its delegation because it has been able to present actual progress in Brazil with regards to parity, electoral parity, the progress in, in popular representation in Brazil and the commitment to the rights of women and gender parity in legislative bodies. But what I found most interesting was where the testimonies we've heard from the council women who spoke today, the elected officials and the vulnerable situation they're in, in this particular uh, situation the elections of November in 2020 and new forms of harassment through cyber attacks. Now in the pandemic, we are not on the streets. So it is understandable that political campaigns are now carried out through electronic media. But here they have shown situations that are very concerning and as it was the case of Ana Lucia Martins, where she focuses on the issue of cyber attacks. So it's not just about protecting women elected officials, but it is also about the new forms of attacks that they suffer in our current world. It's a very concerning issue and the information you have provided helps a lot to better understand the exercise of political rights in Brazil. That is what I just, that is just what I wanted to say. And I would like to say that now the 
civil society has 12 minutes and afterwards we will listen to the state for another 12 minutes. Thank you. Can I start? I would like to start asking the state of which country we are speaking and for those with, with which people they made contact. They are quite selective and uh, they killed my sister and they, there is a lack of commitment by the state to give a response to that case and to other political situations in the country. And there is a general political situation and that doesn't achieve, that doesn't face a violence for women and the trans, transphobia is historical in the country and there is no initiatives by the state. The existence of quotas to broaden the participation of women is not effective if, if there is no uh, focus on that violence that uh, prejudice prejudices the women and any women and any black trans women is submitted to that violence if the state does not recognize that the violence exerted by the state is a failure to its conception there, there are several campaigns, but they do not act to combat several forms of violence against women, and there is no protocol to attend to that violence. The report number does not resolve any of the cases of violence, and it doesn't offer women protection against their uh, policies and we have to understand that uh, impunity is very serious and the intersectionality of that phenomenon, there are several cases which do not receive an answer by the state. I will pass the floor to the city councillor Anna Lucia so that she can answer. I would like to strengthen the remark that the solidarity is not for everybody, it's selective. So the, this call of the minister Damaris to Soeli, it was only to Soelis. And this is how we understand what the state is uh, doing. We ask them, of which women are you speaking? Because according to what I heard here, we are speaking of cases which are not real. So what did the state do in my case? What did the state do for Erica, Carolina and other women here in we would like to know which are the concrete actions made by the state because the campaigns, the incentives, the seminars, the debates, that is what we do on our, in our everyday life. We go to those places, we are threatened, and we would like to know how the state is going to warranty. And we would like to exert our mandate with tranquility because I don't know if you heard that I am paying for myself for my uh, security and the state offered the protection that is given to witnesses. So how am I going to go out of my house and how am I going to comply with my function we, to which I was designated? How? That was the only protection the state had offered and the meeting that we had, the hearing we had, with the agency of security of the state was a request was at the request of the state uh, deputy of my country it was not uh, on the state willingness the state was summoned and the same happened with the 
the police that uh, covers my neighborhood, they do not know how to guarantee the security of a city councilor. Which state are we talking about? So we are here in two different countries. The state says one thing and we receive in our social media and through so, um, I try, I receive threats. I must be in another country, which is not that one of which they are speaking about. So I believe that we need concrete actions, but we do not know who was the perpetrator of the crime against Mariel Franco. We do not want and we cannot have our lives interrupted. That is what we are talking about. We do not want that. We want to continue with Marielle's legacy, but we do not want to finish our office, our time in office as Marielle Frankel did. And what is the state going to do so as to avoid that from, or to prevent that from happening? And it is worth mentioning that last year in Mercosur, the Brazilian state decided not to sign any document whatsoever, including hate crimes against LGBT populations and especially motivated by gender identity. And in this regard, it is worth mentioning that the bill that was mentioned here by Rosangela, the, depu the deputy, leaves aside trans women and it's a bill it has not been passed yet therefore it is not effective moreover it is worth mentioning that during the presentations by the state none of the cases presented by the transvestite or trans population was not even mentioned they did not even thought they did not don't even think about mentioning all of these cases. So we see the constant omission of the state on this topic and the possibility of recognizing the gender identity of these people. And this lack of commitment with the inclusion of trans and transvestite women in an initiative to combat political violence, given the fact that they are the most affected, has no sense and makes no sense. Moreover, the lack of articulation between these state organizations and the political will of building solutions and mechanisms that could take into account the complexity of the topic. And this is crucial given the high indexes of political violences in Brazil. The state is just sending letters and not assuming real measures in order to solve effectively the problems without promoting actions in the several state organizations. The decision of the Supreme Court was mentioned, but it was not the result of an articulation between the government or the state. It was the result of a request presented by Black left-wing Deputy Benedita da Silva. And after several years of movements of Brazilian Black and feminist movements, it is worth mentioning that the change in the electoral law in order to include more women was done after this historical movement, including social society and feminist Brazilian movements, that yet today we see that the decision is not totally respected by the political parties. And this was mentioned. We have only 3% of representation of women and black people, black women, and this is the reality in Brazil, the Brazil that we are talking about. Several of the organizations present here today and parliamentarians are on their own. And let me tell you again, the state has not assumed its commitment with the life of those people and their families, advisors and relatives. If there are no further requests, then I give the floor to the state. Thank you very much, Mr. Commissioner. I would like to thank all the commissioners for their comments and questions. We are going to do our best to answer these questions. 
And if it's not possible, we will send the answers in due time. And I would like to thank the comments and questions in general. On my behalf, I would like to talk about the jurisdiction of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in terms of the Inter-American Convention Against Racism, Racial Discrimination and other types of intolerances. The Brazilian government is happy about the approval by the federal government of this. This was published in a legislative decree and now the text was referred to the president of the Republic where it will be assessed and then published as a presidential decree. We have high confidence that this will happen in the short term. And now I would like to give the floor to Christiani Brita, the secretariat. Thank you very much. I would like to answer some of the questions. I would like to clarify that the National Office of Human Rights receives all these of these complaints and then it refers it for the investigation. We are part of the, as I said, National Organization of Human Rights. And in 2020, we trained more than 300 people just to receive complaints about political violence against women. And these complaints were referred to the National Office of the Public Prosecutor and to the specific areas corresponding to the different jurisdictions of the council women or council candidates in 2020. Moreover, I would like to stress that we have some results, yes, about what we have approved in 2016 in terms of the 30% of women, including trans women in the female quota. And this, this regulation that came first from the Supreme Court, after this, regulation, actually, we had a record of women elected in 2020, 180,023 female candidates in the country, therefore above 28,000 more female candidates than in 2017. And then in 2020, in the elections, we had more women elected, 661 mayors, versus 641 in 2016. And for council women, we also have more than 1,400 new seats. And also there was a drop in the zero representation in the 143 municipalities in 2016. More than 1,900 municipal chambers didn't have even one council woman. And after the campaign, where we all participated and through the initiative of the federal government to have at least one council woman, that number changed. Therefore, we believe that we have positive results after those regulations passed together with the electoral Supreme Court. I would like to make a brief comment. We have the opportunity to follow two different paths. And we have to choose only one. One path is related to policy, to politics and what happens in the political parties. And the other one is to really fight against violence against women. If we're only going to concentrate on politics and political colors, we're going to go through an ephemeral path because we are not going to be doing specific things. If we really want to do something, we need to wonder and to really ask ourselves, how is that the Brazilian state can fight against violence against women? And President Bolsonaro, just to give you a name, in the past years, and let me tell you a little bit about history, but in the past years, the number of women being murdered 
went up 54%. So now we are at a very important moment where we are at a forum, which is extremely important to really decide on specific actions so that every Brazilians can improve their situation. So now what we need to do is to choose the right path, the path of contribution in the Brazilian government. We need to take the right path during the past years, we know that this is a very long path. And as Ms. Da Silva explained, we need to take into account all what is happening. And it's not about denying the existence of these problems. And in many cases, the Brazilian state has denied so. But what we need is a solution. We need to choose the right path in this opportunity. Thank you very much. Once again, I would like to thank all of you for your comments, and I would like to thank Ms. Esmeralda for her questions. First of all, I've been in Parliament since 2020. The city of Aguasu has some seats for council women, and I was the only Black woman from the periphery chosen and i suffered at that moment discrimination by the mayor but still i kept on fighting i kept on fighting i never stopped fighting for my rights i was elected re-elected and then re-elected then i was a candidate for the state and i won those elections i was candidate for senator for the brazilian federal republic i was not elected but i was still fighting for my rights in order to defend women from the periphery to defend the things that i believe in my dear esmeralda i fight against any type of violence. And I would like to thank my party because they have supported me. I am a Republican and my party supported me as councilwoman, as deputy for the state, as senator. I was candidate for the mayorship in 2016. I lost that election. I was mayor candidate now in 2020 and I lost that election, but still, my country, I'm sorry, my party, unlike what was said, stopped supporting me. Therefore, this is something that I wanted to really clarify here. I am against Marielle's death and against any other brother or sister death because I do not defend violence. I was reporter for CPI in Brazil. I truly supported reports and reports. I was the vice president of the Human Rights Commission in Brazil, together with Julian Willia, Erika Tokai, and many others in the commission that were doing a differentiated work because we were not minimizing problems. I believe in the work of women. I believe in the work that we carry out in the country and the problem of discrimination against women, it's not only a Brazilian issue. I went to the UN invited by UN women and I spoke about my work and I realized that several brothers, senators, governors, etc., and even talking with a federal deputy that was talking about how she was humiliated very often and i was the president of the portuguese speaking commission of women and let me tell you ladies and gentlemen that i've seen the worst atrocities as president of the network of women president and i even went to portugal to make a declaration against any type of violence and our work was widely disseminated so this bill is to defend the interests of all women all women it's not only one two or one two or types of women it's all women and as we have here today a meeting against cyber attacks, for example, and Brazil 
is not omitting this. And my party actually supported me to go and make history here in the Chamber of Deputies in order to sit down to talk because the parliament is a place to talk the recommendations that were made by Bruna. Why didn't you come and approach me to discuss all this with all the agents involved so that we could do all things better? Because I have always promoted dialogue and my idea is to defend the rights of everyone. So I feel no embarrassment whatsoever. I am open for dialogue. And this is not only a problem in Brazil, this is a problem in every country and it's not new Esmeralda. And this is why I made that proposal in 2015. Thank you very much. I take what my colleagues have said and I believe that unlike what I was expecting, when Sueli was seen as conservative, for example, she used to defend causes for black people, but many things have changed. So I would like to say that we are looking at the future now. And for the future, I see representation. We are elected women trans women that were elected. And the discussion that is open now is a reality that is changing. And we are here to represent that. And once again, let me tell you that I opened a door here in Baru that was closed and I left it open for other black women like myself could enter and do their part. And I think that that's important. We are a little far from dialogue, but I believe that we need to keep on working. I think that we are in a path of change and all of this is possible. This change is possible. Thank you very much. We have now finished with the allotted time for this intervention. Can we use 2.30 minutes, 2.5? You have two, two minutes, minutes, please. Brazil would don't want to to let that happen. I'm sorry. This is dialogue. This informal dialogue. I cannot you cannot challenge someone. The use the of right the speak. word. If after the two minutes used by if Carolina, after her two state, minutes you can have two more minutes, two then you can. Minutes, but you cannot challenge will be, her. The state will be able to do so. This is a respectful dialogue. We will listen to you for two minutes, Carolina. Thank you very much. I would like to clarify that I have not received any support whatsoever from the Brazilian state, not even a phone call. And what was done by the Human Rights Commission and Minorities Commission from the Federal Chamber of Deputies was done through political parties from the progressive democratic field. I just wanted to clarify this. And it's not things about political parties. It's not an issue of political colors. Actually, I worked for 10 years in the municipal public service in Sao Paulo, and I was a servant in different ideological spectrums. So we are all here representing the civil society, and we believe that it is the duty of the state. One thing is the, polit the political duties of the government and the state. And it's important for us to say here that it's not predisposition from the state for or to support with its all of its protection network to support the parliamentarians, especially trans women that are parliamentarians. For example, we are hiring security staff with no support whatsoever from the state. So I believe that saying that this is partisanship would be very unrealistic, to be honest. Also, I believe that saying that the requesters like Bruna Benedit were not requesting to the Brazilian state is also unrealistic because 
in the National Association of Transvestites and Trans, we have done a lot. I'd like to make a final intervention of two minutes. If that's not the case, then we will wrap up the session. President, I think that Mr. Milton Nunez was interested in speaking. Yes, I apologize. You have the, the floor. Thank you for the opportunity. I am sorry for the way in which I am going to, uh, that, that, I, that I spoke when I was putting on my lawyer's hat where I wanted to challenge the comment from the civil society, but we would like to say that we are at the disposal even of Carolini Yara that mentioned that she did not receive any sort of support from the state. The Ministry of Women is at the disposal of each one of the women trans, transvestites that are suffering political violence. We are here for you because we are all here pursuing the same purpose. In our discourse, we said that we wanted to stress that each one of the seven names that were mentioned by the requesting party, each one of them was revised and will be revised in order to review if there were previous actions by the state, especially through our human rights office. And here we can confirm that each one of the seven names were taken by the state. In terms of results, we are going to answer together. And this goes beyond political parties. And here, the state has the same interest as the civil society. We would like to live in a Brazil with no type of discrimination whatsoever in terms of sexual orientation, color, sex, race, gender identity. We are all Brazilians and no one will be left aside. Thank you. Thank you all for your understanding. It is now the end of the hearing. We have run out of time. I would just like to make one final reflection. I think that in on all of the participants of this hearing, there's consensus on several things. First, the importance on moving forward with the political rights of women and reaching parity in popular representation bodies. Second, everyone totally rejects gender violence based on political reasons. And they are all determined to move forward uh, Brazil free of all forms of discrimination. I think it is clear for all of us. Of course, there's some di dissatisfaction from the requesting parties on the intention to deepen the policies that protect women who are part of political life because of their sexual diversity or their gender identity or because of the color of their skin. That is what they are requesting. Strengthening this potential, these policies. And this is something all countries need to move forward with, eliminating these structural situations. In our societies, there still are patterns of discrimination based on race, gender, or sexual orientation. And we need to start on attacking these structural patterns and offering warranties of those, to, to those who are vulnerable. That is my final message to the state and the society of Brazil in general, moving forward with these protection policies Thank you all for being here this 
hearing has been very interesting and important for the commission. Have a great day. Thank you all. Good day. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you.